In the summer of 1936, the Democratic Republic of Spain was just five years old. For centuries, a powerful triumvirate of grandee landowners, unreformed church, and warlord military had kept Spain in poverty and feudal backwardness. On July 18, 1936, refusing to accept modest reforms or the results of Spanish elections that had been held only months earlier, Generalissimo Francisco Franco unleashed a vicious and bloody rebellion against the new republic. In his war against Spain's democracy, Franco had the unquestioning support of Spain's traditional rulers and the country's fascists. But that coalition had a yet more fearsome ally, and that was the rising power of Nazi Germany and Mussolini's Italy. It is now 80 years since the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War, but the heat and fire of that struggle still resonates with us and has a sustained ability to bring forth a continued stream of new writing, art, and analysis. This evening, I'm going to be speaking about a Vancouver connection to the war in Spain and a local contribution to the continuing stream of new information. First, I'm going to talk about this book, Mac Papp, Memoir of a Canadian in the Spanish Civil War. And then, after having given you an outline of the book, I'll tell you something of Ron Liversidge, who is the author of that memoir. And finally, I'll say something to you about how this book finally came to be published and available to you. In the spring of 1937, uh, Two Canadians traveled to Europe and wrote up their experiences. Ron Liversidge was one, but to put his story in context, I'll tell you a little bit about the other Canadian. That was William Lyon Mackenzie King. Um, he was the Prime Minister of Canada, and he didn't, like Liversidge, didn't go to Spain, uh, he went to Germany. And he went to Germany to pay an official visit to Hitler. Now, by the spring of 1937, fascism had clearly shown its hand. There wasn't much guesswork about what fascism meant. Here's a brief recap of the rise of the Nazis to that point. Now, you might think that that would convince any reasonable person that what fascism involved was the destruction of democracy and human rights, virulent anti-Semitism, state violence against its own people, offensive militarization, aggressive territorial expansion, and savage disregard for the value of human life. And in Spain, just two months before Mackenzie King's tea with Hitler, the mass terror bombing of the civilian population of Guernica had been unleashed by the German Luftwaffe. Around the world, people knew and reacted in horror to this experiment in fascist barbarity and knew that it was a warning of things to come. So we really do have to ask why Mackenzie King, on behalf of our country, needs to do the Nazis the honor of, an, of a state visit. But he does. On June 29, 1937, our Prime Minister spends the morning with Hermann Göring, who was, amongst other things, the head of the said Luftwaffe of Guernica fame. And in the afternoon, Mackenzie King presents himself at Hindenburg Castle and has a lengthy meeting with Hitler himself. He makes small talk, He's happy to accept Hitler's personally autographed portrait for Canada. And he writes in his diary that very evening that his host is one who really loves his fellow man and that he found Hitler deeply sincere and a genuine patriot. More than a year later, in August 1938, Mackenzie King would still be writing that Hitler would seem to have within his power to be literally the savior of mankind. So what's going on here? 
Well, first, Mackenzie King's friendly meeting with Hitler and the Nazis is absolutely in line with the consistent British foreign policy of appeasement of the fascist powers that lasts from Hitler's seizure of power in Germany to the tragic Munich Agreement and even beyond. Second, in no small part, that policy of appeasement was based on the incredibly short-sighted prospect that the fascist powers could be a positively useful force to combat communism and to militarily weaken the, or destroy the growing power of the Soviet Union. Third, it's also clear that Mackenzie King and a number of other Canadian political leaders were fascinated by fascism. They saw fascist, fascist regimes as success stories in those countries and a number of them went to see if there were aspects of it that could be of use at home. You might be interested in a local example of that. In March 1935, Vancouver's liberal mayor of the day, Jerry McGeer, of Aunt Ottawa Trek fame, actually, uh, welcomed a German warship, the Karlsruhe, to our port and attended a lavish civic dinner for the Nazi officers. Now that event did not go unnoticed by the left in the city. The province headline was, Rocks Fly at German Welcome. Well, so we welcomed the Karlsruhe to our port and then it went on, uh, first of all, to assist Franco directly during the Spanish Civil War and then later at the outset of the Second World War, the, this destroyer that we feted in Vancouver uh, was very much a part of the invasion of Norway. Well, so there you have an uh, a flavor of official Canada's reaction to the rise of fascism. Later in the Cold War years, the international volunteers who went to Spain were actually termed in official circles premature anti-fascists. And you can see why. In 1937, official Canada, at a minimum, was willfully blind to the threat that fascism posed to Western democracy and completely hostile to the idea that in the end it would have to be resisted by force of arms. When the Spanish Civil War broke out, Mackenzie King, again following the lead of the British government, enacted a law called the Foreign Enlistment Act, by which Canadians who sought to fight for democracy in Spain were threatened with imprisonment for up to two years, and that could include hard labor. Imprisonment for two years with hard labor. Hmm. Well, that kind of threat wasn't anything like enough to deter Ron Liversedge. He had a very different response to the events in Europe. Unlike Mackenzie King, Liversidge and about 1,500 other Canadian volunteers did understand the necessity of resisting fascism early and everywhere. They went to Spain and put their lives on the line to fight on behalf of the democratic government of that country. Liversidge went to Spain in May of 1937 and served in the Mackenzie Papineau Battalion for two years. And unlike literally hundreds of other Canadians who did that, he lived to tell the tale. And in fact, he has written a fascinating and powerful memoir of that whole experience. Mac Pap is a unique book. It is the only published memoir of a Canadian in the Mac Pap Battalion and a significant addition to the unfortunately sparse writing to date about the Canadians who volunteered to go to Spain. Now I hope that you will have the opportunity, and some of you I know already have had the opportunity, to read Mac Pap for yourself. But here is a brief preview of what you will find if you delve into the book. First, you'll get an insight into how the Mac Paps dealt with the government's hostility and outright illegality. The recruitment of volunteers for Spain, their clandestine journey out of Canada and into the battlefield, all financed on a shoestring, uh, is described in a very kind of wry narrative by Liversidge. Um, this, as you probably know, is the CPR station. It uh, is just right across the street from us. Um, this is where 
Liversidge started his journey to Spain and where two years later uh, he was to end it. For Liversidge, the danger of Spain begins before he lands there. He describes in the book in, in gripping detail the sinking of his ship by a fascist submarine, which was a tragedy in which scores of his fellow volunteers from around the world, literally, but including six Canadians, were killed before even reaching Spain. MacPap lays out in, spark, in, in very stark detail the incredible disparity between the war materials available to the two sides. Franco had the full and direct support of Hitler's Nazi Germany, which supplied him with the latest high-tech weaponry, tanks, and military expertise. And in particular, Hitler sent the dreaded Condor Legion of the Luftwaffe, which gave the fascists immediate air superiority and military advantage. Franco also received direct support from Mussolini, who in addition to materiel supplied more than a 100,000 Italian troops. The Republican side, on the other hand, was faced with a blockade erected by the Western powers. It had some Soviet support, but very often its military equipment was adequated, antiquated and so scarce that many international volunteers had no training with real, real weapons before they were sent to fight in actual battles. Typical of the lack of supplies was that in Liversedge's case, he was issued nothing but the Spanish kind of rope-soled espadrilles called alpargatas, and he had rope-soled shoes in the trenches in the mud for the whole of the war. One of the most interesting sections of the book, at least for me, is the description of the formation of the Canadians Mackenzie Papineau Battalion. That took place over the resistance of the primarily American leadership of the English-speaking 15th Brigade, 15th Brigade of the International Brigades. Liversidge is right in the middle of that, and actually, on his description, he becomes the very first Mac Pap. But the, I'll say a little bit more about the establishment of the Mackenzie Papineau Battalion a bit later and in a different context. Then in his memoir you read of the baptism of fire of the Mac Paps, the first engagement of the Mac Paps after their very brief training and that takes place at the ill-fated Battle of Fuentes de Ebro. Liversedge gives a full trench level view of the horrors of that battle and then his later experiences in an artillery outfit. His outfit stubbornly but vainly resisted the fascist drive down the Ebro Valley to the Mediterranean which had the effect of cutting the Republic in half and set the stage for Franco's ultimate military victory. Mac Pap paints a vivid picture of Spain at war. Not only the grim conditions in the military, but the savage effect of the war on the civilian population, the victims of both fascist warfare and the Western blockade, which produced conditions of near starvation. In Liversidge's memoir, you will meet scores of the interesting personalities he encounters who were drawn to the struggle in Spain. You get his assessment of some of the famous visitors and of the commanders who were running the show from the Republican side. He has interesting comments about many of them. But most movingly, he paints a picture of the many other Canadian working class volunteers who had been longtime comrades of Liversedge through the Depression and who, day by day, fall victim to the ferocious death rate in that desperate war. 
But perhaps most importantly in MACPAP, you will get a sense of why the fight was so important to Liversidge and to the 1,500 other Canadians that were there with him. What they felt was at stake and how they developed such a respect and a connection with the beleaguered Spanish people that they maintained their passion and their commitment in the face of overwhelming odds right to the end and always after. So, in a nutshell, MacPap tells the story of an amazing collection of Canadians who, against the official policy of the Canadian government, did their utmost to help stop the rise of fascism in Europe and tried to prevent the victory of a fascist regime that unfortunately triumphed and would use that triumph to oppress the Spanish people for 40 years. That is a story that more Canadians should know. And those who already know much of it will still learn enormously from Ron Liversidge's telling. So who was Ron Liversidge and how did he come to write this memorable memoir? Well, he was born Rowland Liversidge or Roland Liversidge, I guess, and he was born in Eng England in 1899 uh, he would become Ronald much later when he came to Canada. His father was a skilled dyer in the textile trade that was flourishing at that time in his hometown of Keithley in Yorkshire, not far from Leeds. Roland was the second youngest of nine children. His mother returned to work in the textile trade when the last of the nine was born. They lived in the poorest area of the town despite his father's craft status in the mill. Roland started school at age six, and he received a very basic and very British education, but in order to help support the family, he was obliged to leave school at age 12. This is a guy who wrote two important Canadian books. He leaves school at age 12, and that was all the formal education that he would ever receive. Liversidge worked in the cotton industry like his parents until he was 15 when the First World War broke out. Initially, he was enthusiastic about the war and he joined up with the West, West Yorkshire Regiment as soon as he could. But that enthusiasm cooled quickly. He was at the front in France for over three years. He was wounded first at Ypres and then again at the Second Battle of the Marne. He returned to England from World War I, aghast at its bloody obscenity, in poor health, but through that process, a committed Marxist. In the book, you'll find out one of those um, epiphany moments that people sometimes have in life when he saw Marxism and saw the world in a very different way, a way that informed the rest of his, his life and the rest of his activity. Back home in England, he studied politics. He joined the Communist Party of Britain when it was set up in 1921, but in addition, spent a lot of time looking unsuccessfully for work. In 1921, he married Lavinia Boucher and had a son. His search for employment took him for a number of years to Australia after 1923, he found in Australia some work as a swagman in the sheep sheds, but nothing permanent there, and he returned to Britain in 1926. Now there he was able to find some factory work, but then immediately participated in the general strike of 1926, uh, in which he handed out leaflets to soldiers urging them not to fire on the workers. And for that trouble in the aftermath of the strike, he found himself seriously blacklisted. With no prospects in Spain, excuse me, with no prospects in Britain, Liversidge emigrated to Canada in the spring of 1927, leaving his family behind. 
His wife, Lavinia, died of influenza that swept Britain and Europe in that year. And his son survived, but remained in England, raised by an aunt. Liversidge's arrival in Canada coincides with the actual onset of Canada's depression years. Most people seem to think it started in 1929 after the famous crash, but Liversidge, I think, knew immediately that the depression was on and that depression for him was to last for a decade. He was, with very few exceptions, essentially without paid work for 10 years. With only sporadic labor work, Liversedge spent the dirty 30s like thousands of Canadians, riding the rods, bumming handouts, and spending time in flop houses, soup kitchens, relief camps, and more than one jail. Well, he is then drawn into the protests against the conditions. And again, that's from his background uh, and the reading he had done. He becomes active in organizing the Relief Camp Workers Union. And uh, what that does is that gets him blacklisted from the relief camps. Now, a lot of people that were blacklisted from the relief camps in, in BC and across Canada in the 1930s, um, I guess it was before databases, they didn't have much trouble with that, and they would just uh, adopt a, a nom de guerre, and they would just go back to the camp um, in some other name. Um, but Liversidge didn't do that, and instead uh, he took the opportunity that was offered to him to become the editor of uh, the feisty Mimeo newspaper that the relief camp workers put out. And so he actually assembled stories and wrote columns and put out this relief camp worker every couple of weeks for more than a year. Um, about the same time, he had joined up with the Communist Party of Canada. Uh, the date that's given for that most often is 1933. I, I suspect he was in from the minute he got off the boat, but the, the, the paper says 1933. In 1935, Liversedge is an organizer of the mass strike of BC, relief camp workers, of BC relief camp workers, and he participates in eight solid weeks of protests in, Vancouver's, in Vancouver that had a, a variety of activities supporting the strikers. This is a photograph of something called the Snake Parades, in which the, in a kind of a quasi-military fashion, the unemployed workers would would uh, parade in, in a, a snake pattern in the streets. And, and uh, it uh, was very disciplined and also apparently very entertaining to watch. And, and they actually would raise money doing that by tin canning as they were doing these parades. Uh, there, of course, were occupations of the, uh, of the city library and uh, the famous reading of the Riot Act by Jerry McGeer, the guy that welcomed the Nazi cruiser to Vancouver. Jerry McGeer reads the Riot Act against the uh, unemployed protesters. Well, after eight weeks of protest in June of 1939, with more than a thousand of the strikers, Liversedge takes part in the legendary On to Ottawa trek, getting as far on the boxcars as Regina and there, the Prime Minister, R.B. Bennett, whose nickname was Iron Heel, and he was someone who actually didn't need to go to Germany to figure out what parts of fascism you could use in Canada. Uh, he ordered the protest to be broken, which it was, by force of arms on Dominion Day, 1935. The Ontawa trek, the Dominion Day riot, uh, watershed events in Canada's social history. And we'll see a bit later, and actually Om has stolen my thunder, about the part that Ron Liversedge himself played in the preservation of that story. Back in BC, uh, Ron Liversedge spent further time in the new kind of revamped relief projects, and then he actually found work in the North, both as a miner and a mine union organizer. 
And this, of course, takes us to the spring of 1937. And it is there, while he's working in the mines up north, that Liversidge hears of the fascist insurrection in Spain, and he determines that he has to go. Well, his decision to go, and how he got to go there, and what he did for two years serving in Spain, that is what you read in the memoir that uh, Liversedge has written to describe that, that experience in detail. No sooner does Ron Liversidge return from Spain after the two years fighting in, the, in 1939 that the Second World War breaks out. Liversidge, for the first time since coming to Canada, finds steady work in the Vancouver shipbuilding industry. And actually, prior to going to Spain, but again on his return from Spain, uh, he meets Mildred Dugan. Mildred Dugan was a, a very skilled telephone operator who comes from Vancouver Island. And during the war, they were married in Vancouver. After a couple of years in the post-war period when the shipbuilding industry collapses in the post-war and his employment in the shipbuilding comes to an end, they move to Lake Cowichan on Vancouver Island. And Liversidge and Mildred live there for the rest of their lives. Uh, he finds work mostly in the lumber camps. They built a modest home and they lived a very modest life on a very modest income. Liversedge kept in touch with the MACPAP vets and their organization. He remained a Communist Party supporter all his life. And the Liversedges in Lake Cowichan toughed out the, f the worst years of the Cold War in a quiet retreat. And I have to tell you, with the help of a few pints. And there is a link between that and the next part I'll tell you, which is Ron's writing. Uh, I'll leave it to you to read in the book what the link is, but nevertheless, in the mid-1950s, Ron Liversidge is persuaded to start writing about the important events in his life. Working almost completely from memory, his writing captured the spirit and the urgency of his 1930s adventures. And he did it accurately, amazingly accurately from memory. People check what he writes against you know, the written record, and it, uh, it, it is astounding the amount of, of detail that he retained and was able to write about. But he also writes about it in a style that's, that's really feisty. It's really straightforward. It's thoughtful. And at the same time, it's just absolutely straight on partisan. His first book that he turns to is completed in 1959, and it is his recollections of the Ontawa Trek. Now this is 1959, 25 years after the trek, and at that point, sorry to say for Canadian historians, that no historian, no academic, no journalist had written up the story of the trek. In fact, but for Liversidge's book, that Canadian chapter might have been lost. Now, it was initially published in a mimeograph edition, and this is the, uh, the front cover of that edition, by the BC section of the Communist Party in 1961. It was, as I said, the first full recounting of the trek and its origins, and many would still say that it's the best. On to Ottawa, in this form, uh, found its way into uh, many university collections and archives, and it eventually, or not uh, so long actually, it, it quite quickly came to the notice of university historians. As a result of that, and his collaboration with uh, Professor Hoare, it was professionally published uh, by McClellan and Stewart in the Carleton University series in 1973. So, Ron Liversidge's book, the first writing on the subject, 
uh, really was the launching pad for a small flood of articles, books, videos, commentaries that have subsequently appeared about the Ant Ottawa Trek. And his writing, the first writing, has, act has been heavily relied on by just about all of the writers writing on the subject because it tells the story so well and in so much detail that is just so down to earth and so straightforward. Now, of course, that was Liversidge's first book. His second book was what we're here to talk about tonight, The Memoir of the Spanish Civil War. On to Ottawa was completed in 1959. The Spanish memoir was completed in 1966. Now, like the On to Ottawa book, it was, in fact, the very first major writing by a Canadian on a significant event in our social history, Canadians' participation in the Spanish Civil War. But unlike the On to Ottawa book, unfortunately for Ron and the rest of us, it was not to see publication in his lifetime. Ron Liversidge died at age 75, died in Cowichan, where he had lived for decades, and he died on May Day, May 1st, 1974. So why it is that his MacPap memoir did not appear then, and how it did come to appear 40 years after his death, well, that is what I will finish off with now. As soon as Liversidge finished his Spanish manuscript, he was a Communist Party guy, and he sent it to the publishing house of the Communist Party of Canada. That was this outfit, Progress Books, was a small but established outfit in Toronto. And he did that despite the fact that Progress, for reasons that had never been disclosed, uh, had not been and had in fact declined to print his Aunt Ottawa book. Well, at first, Progress seemed to have learned a lesson, and it made a public announcement that it would be publishing his Spanish memoir, but it didn't do that. In instead, it, it simply sat on it for two years, and then he, it then abruptly returned the manuscript. And you'll discover that uh, in fact, it was, it was uh, a little bit unsettling for Liver's Edge. They didn't actually even return it to him. They returned it to the BC leader of the Communist Party, who then gave it to him. And he actually was quite broken up by that and couldn't figure out why that was. But that's what happened. So at that point, which takes us to about 1970, Irene, excuse me, uh, Ron Liversedge turned to this woman, Irene Howard. Now, Irene Howard was a, uh, an author, a, a Vancouver social historian. I think she's probably best known for uh, a book she wrote about the Vancouver uh, Swedish community and uh, called uh, Vancouver Svenskar. And she had helped in the preparation of his Aunt Ottawa manuscript for, uh, for McClellan and Stewart. And so, she knew her way around the publishing industry. Liversidge hired her as his literary agent. And she then turned to, and the first thing that she did was to take his manuscript and edit it quite extensively. And then in 1971 and 1972, she submitted the revised manuscript again and again and again to a raft of Canadian publishers. Despite her enthusiasm, and she was just incredibly enthusiastic and dedicated about this, and her relentless efforts and arm twisting of publishers, I'm sad to report that the Canadian publishing industry of the time just wasn't interested. Howard sent the story to at least 14 publishers, and she received an equal number of polite and not so polite rejections. She went back to Progress Books, which, again, for the second time, said no. Now, 
In retrospect, the rejection by mainstream and even soft left publishers is not all that surprising. The Canadian publishing industry of the day was not noted for an adventuresome character. And the lingering chill of the Cold War probably was still having its effect in light of the uh, unapologetic, unapologetically and enthusiastically red hue of Liversidge's writing in Calling a Spade a Spade. Irene Howard wrote in despair, the publishers who have read the manuscript agree with me. It is indeed a fine, authentic document. Unfortunately, it won't make money for them. It seems to me too bad that this episode in Canadian history should be so little known and that this story shouldn't find a publisher because it didn't meet the needs of the market. Well, that sort of explains the mainstream publishers, but I think the reception by Progress Books remains a different kind of a mystery and one that ever since the book has come out, I've been asked about a lot. Um, Progress gave no reasons to Ron at the time or subsequently, and so I'm afraid that all I can offer is a little bit of speculation. And I'm act, asked about this so often that I'm going to indulge myself and give a little bit of speculation. <clears throat> one population, or excuse me, one possibility is that it was just too much work for them. Um, as you will recall, oops, as you will recall, uh, Ron actually only had a grade five education. And uh, I can tell you that he wasn't too troubled by things like punctuation or spelling or paragraphs or that kind of stuff. And so uh, the original manuscript at that level did need quite a lot of that kind of editing. But I mean that isn't really all that bad and when I eventually came to, to do that job uh, I had a lot of fun. It was, it was great to, uh, to just take the really wonderful storytelling that he had written and just tidy it up a bit. But, I don't know, Progress Books, it was a small operation. It had a lot of other fish to fry at that time. And so maybe that was all that there was to it. It was just, it was just a project that they didn't feel they could take on, you know, in terms of how much effort it would be and how much reward there would be. I, I hope, well, I don't know. If, if that's what they thought, I think they made a big mistake. Um, but that not being such a good possibility. The other possibility that has occurred to me, and this is where I usually get into trouble, is that Ron committed some kind of political error in his book from the party's point of view. Now, River, Ron Liversidge was, I think till the day he died, a very loyal and dedicated Communist Party member. He was a party guy, but on the other hand, that never stopped him from calling things as he saw them. And so as a result of that, there are maybe a couple of places in the book where he might have given offense, depending on how sensitive you were. Um, and I'll tell you about two that have come to mind. And again, I tell you this is only speculation. One of them is this. The Canadian Communist Party often seemed to me, having had some experience with it, to be unduly deferential to its counterpart in the United States. When Liversidge describes the fight that he has to go through with the other Canadians that are in Spain uh, to establish a Canadian Mackenzie Papineau battalion, uh, this is what he says. The Americans' argument usually went thus. Well, fellows, we're all in this together. We're practically one people. There are more of us Americans here. The people of Europe don't know very much about Canada. They actually think we're one nation, and so on. There was a, and this is Ron again, there was a tendency on the part of a certain section of the American political and intellectual coterie to regard Canadian cousins as poor relations. Well, I don't know, that might have done it. Um, very interestingly, when Ron's MacPap memoir was reviewed in the journal of the Americans' equivalent, the Abraham Lincoln Battalion's paper, uh, 
that was actually the very passage that they uh, kind of highlighted in their review of the book. So I think it probably struck a chord somewhere. Um, and again, uh, that uh, may or may not have had anything to do with Progress's decision not to publish, but it might have. Um, there's another political possibility, and it's, this is equally speculative. I keep emphasizing that. It has to do with, with, oh, I'm sorry. I should have had that before. That's the American intellectual and political coterie, uh, the, the uh, commanders of the, of the 15th Battalion who were, who were, uh, <laughs> who, who were almost to a person uh, Americans with very few British and, and, and no Canadians in the high leadership. Anyways, the other possibility has to do with this fellow. And, uh, you know, again, this is where I am likely to get into trouble, but nevertheless, I'll say to you, this is André Marty. Now, André, André Marty was a French communist, and he was the political commissar and really the principal organizer, in a way, of the entire uh, international brigades in Spain. The, the creation of the international brigades uh, was uh, a proposal that the common turn uh, in the fall of 1936 put to the Spanish government. And the Spanish government, reluctantly at first, but nevertheless, in the end, gratefully said, yes, sure, or organize military assistance to come to Spain to help us because the fascists of yours got help. They got help from Hitler and they got Ma Ma Mussolini. They've got the officer corps uh, of the Spanish army. No, we, we need help. So, let, so the Spanish Republic agreed uh, to accept that kind of, of assistance. Now, and Marti was very much at the center of, of the organization of that. And during the whole course of the war, he remained essentially the political leader of the international brigades. Now, Marti in France was a revered hero. And that is because in 1917, he had led the Black Sea Mutiny. The Black Sea Mutiny was a, a famous event in which the French uh, sailors in the ships of the French Navy who were in the Black Sea uh, mutinied and refused absolutely to fight the Russian revolutionaries who were in the midst of, of the Russian revolution of that year. So in Spain, he, in, in France, he, he was revered. He was uh, a high leader of the Communist Party and he was um, uh, well, elected repeatedly to the National Assembly. But in Spain, well, um, I'll just tell it how I see it, he was very widely regarded as having become paranoid. Uh, he saw tr spies everywhere. He was very much part of the, uh, of the very um, uh, determined anti-Trotskyist uh, initiatives that were being taken by the Communist Party internationally. Uh, he didn't like the anarchists very much either. And he had a tendency to see spies operating on behalf of those parties and the fascists, or the theory often being that those parties were actually in league with each other in, in the view of, of some of the communist leadership, including Marti. Uh, and he also had the, the, uh, the reputation of being essentially vicious and that he was uh, very easy in using his, the power that he had to, to uh, order executions of people who were thought or in some degree proved to be spies or cowards. So. Despite that, though, I mean, he remained the communist leader and the leader of the international brigades, not only in Spain, but during the Second World War. In the Second World War, he was the French Communist Party's uh, representative on, on the de Gaulle Free French Forces Council of War, uh, which uh, you know, was a, 
an incredibly responsible position in that war. But he, uh, he kept doing weird things. And after the Second World War, his actions became so bizarre that he was finally expelled from the French Communist Party. But for some reason, and I don't understand this, but for some reason, both the, the French Communist Party and the international communist movement have to a very large extent clung to the position that while he was expelled for good cause after the Second World War, everything he had done up to that point, and particularly everything that he had done in Spain, was just right. Well, this is what Ron wrote. In the International Brigade headquarters at Albacete, quite often I would see the brooding, silent, gray figure of André Marti coming into our building. He was then already exhibiting the signs of mental deterioration brought on by his hard life as a revolutionary. Well, I thought that was kind of kind, actually, but nevertheless, uh, you might not think that that would be enough to get Liversedge in trouble, but then uh, you may or may not know that even in the late 1950s, even Ernest Hemingway was put on the do not ship list by the communists for having written exactly the same thing, that in Spain, Marti was crazy. Well, that's the end of my speculation. Um, the truth of the matter is that in the end, Ron Liversidge himself got no reasons for the rejections by Progress Books. Sorry, I should have. And the truth of the matter is that he was growing old, he was getting sick, and he was getting discouraged. And I also think that he was not completely happy with the extent of the revisions to the manuscript to his book that Irene Howard had made. So in the spring of 1972, he asked for his original manuscript back from Irene Howard. She retained her own uh, edited version of it and, and in fact, uh, still, even, even after he kind of fired her as literary agent, still made attempts to get it published. She really was, did want it to happen, but uh, he wanted his original manuscript back. She put it in a brown envelope and mailed it from Vancouver to Lake Cowichan. Well, that's where I stumble into the story. This is the summer, this, this return of the manuscript happens in the spring of 1972 and in the summer of 1972, uh, just before I started law school at UBC, I went to Lake Cowichan to interview Ron. And the reason I was doing that was that I had written an undergrad paper for a history course at Simon Fraser uh, about the Workers' Unity League. Now, I wanted to see if Ron could tell me more about the Workers' Unity League. It was the union of, of or the, the central of left-wing unions in the first half of the 1930s that did incredible organizing and ran incredible strikes in the teeth of the Depression um, and was, in fact, the parent organization, if you will, of the Relief Camp Workers Union that, that sponsored and, and conducted the On to Ottawa Trek. So I wanted to see if Ron could tell me more about it because the League had played such a big role in the Trek. Well, Ron could, and he did, and he welcomed me in, to his house in just the most wonderful way. It was um, uh, very sad to say that was the one and only time that I actually ever met Ron, but I will never forget it. He was really a real salt of the earth, real neat guy. But, and then starts the embarrassing part. First embarrassing part is that somehow or other, I didn't know that Ron had been in Spain. I knew all about his activity in the Depression and the Ont Ottawa Trek, but the fact that he had been one of the Canadian volunteers in Spain was unknown to me. So I missed the opportunity of a lifetime to ask him about it. So nothing was said about the Spanish Civil War during the whole of this morning that I had talking to, to Ron. So we were on the porch of his house. He's literally saying goodbye to me. And just at the very last moment, he says, just, just a second, just a second, just a minute. And he goes back into the house, and he comes back out, 
and he's got Irene Howard's brown envelope with his original manuscript in it. And he says, here, have a look at it. I think that people would like to read this if it were published. Well, that's the second embarrassing part, isn't it? Ron, of course, was absolutely right. People would want to read it if it were published, but it took me 40 years to get to it. <laughs> I, mean, I have a lot of things on the to-do list, but I think that held the record, actually. I didn't get to read it, and this is the excuse part. I didn't get to read it because I, month, you know, a month later, ended up in, in law school. And some of you have been to first year law school, and you'll know that you don't do much else except read law stuff. And then I didn't get to read it before Ron Liversedge himself died just two years later. For years, it lay in a file in my filing cabinet. And when I did read it, when I did read it and, and wade through the spelling errors and the punctuation and the no paragraphs, but I knew immediately that, yeah, it did have to be published. But my best intentions always fell victim to procrastination, inertia, and work. I forgot. The other excuse, of course, is that uh, after getting out of law school, I worked for the BCTF. And that'll put the kibosh on all kinds of good stuff. <laughs> so it wasn't until actually I'd retired from the BCTF, uh, and in fact, not until 2010, that I got the push I needed. Uh, as, Om, as Om said, there were a group of us, including Om, who had worked on a commemoration of the 75th anniversary, anniversary of the On to Ottawa Trek. And uh, that commemoration went off quite well, I think, Om, if I do say. And so we were actually having a bit of a wrap-up celebration and wondering, OK, well, now what do we do? Uh, what's next? And in the course of that, uh, the subject of Ron Liversedge and his book about the trek naturally came up because, like I say, he was sort of the, the beginning of people knowing about the story of the trek. And so um, I kind of sheepishly admitted that actually I had the manuscript of the other Ron Liversedge book in my basement. Uh, and so Om um, uh, and Joey and some of the others uh, employed what might politely be termed social pressure to, to get me to commit to getting Pap, Mac Pap um, out of my filing cabinet and into the daylight. Well, there were basically four things needed to do that, and with a lot of help from a lot of good people, um, magically all four of them did come together. Now the first, as I said before, was editing the manuscript. Um, that wasn't too hard, and it wasn't too hard, as I said, because Ron was a good storyteller, and his text had to just be tidied up a bit. Uh, I tried very hard to keep Ron's voice. Ron has a, a really uh, individual kind of voice in his writing, and I tried hard to keep that because I had the feeling that part of the problem before had been that the revisions had resulted in the loss of some of that. And Irene Howard herself actually came to that conclusion later on. So the editing part was easy. I just started from what he had written and didn't stray very much and just tidied it up a bit. Well, the second task I had was writing annotations. And if you read the book, you'll see that, I don't know, about 35% of the book is actually not Ron's memoir, but these annotations that I felt compelled to write. Well, I did that because at the time of the Spanish Civil War, what, what Liversidge was writing about would have been well known to a lot of people, particularly a lot of people in Vancouver, because there's a lot of Vancouver content and, and references in the book. And actually, at the time he wrote the memoir, in the mid-60s, uh, still people would probably have remembered quite a lot of what he was talking about. But now, when I finally get around to it, it's more than 75 years after the events. And a lot of what people knew in the collective consciousness 
had been lost. So I set about to write some explanatory background information, even straight into commentary a little bit here and there, about some of the fascinating people and the exotic places and the military events that you will encounter in Ron's book. Here's one example. Uh, not many people today remember a fellow named Dr. Lyle Telford. This is Dr. Lyle Telford. Um, I have a particular connection with Lyle Telford, but that's a different story. Ron's connection with Dr. Lyle Telford was that uh, Telford helped Ron and many, many Mac Paps actually get to Spain in the first place. And in this way, that although the Mackenzie King government had said passports aren't valid for travel to Spain, you actually had to get a passport in order to get as close to Spain as you could, like France, which is where most of the international volunteers went through in order to get to Spain. And these are working class guys who've you know, been riding the rods and, and so where do they get some upstanding citizen? You know, you know how you used to have to have an upstanding citizen to, to uh, guarantee you for your passport. Um, well, most of them didn't know any, but uh, if you went down to Dr. Telford's office, Dr. Telford would sign you up. And uh, um, Ron describes going having been refused actually by a number of other upstanding citizens who wouldn't sign his passport, he went down and said, yep, Telford will sign up. And there's a, there's a, nice, there's a nice description of that in, in the book. But Telford was not just a really helpful doctor. He, at the time, was, um, he was a radio orator. He had a regular um, radio program. He was uh, always described as silver-tongued and silver-maned. Um, he was a CCF socialist. He was a member of the legislature. Uh, he was decades ahead of his time in advocating for socialized medicine, Medicare, and health care for everybody. Uh, way ahead of his time on that. And at the time that the MACPAPs return uh, from Spain, he has actually been elected as the mayor of Vancouver and he is there to, to welcome the MACPAPs on behalf of the city of Vancouver when they come back to Vancouver after the war. Well, that's one example of you know, someone who was actually really well known at the time, but very, very few people know about Lyle Telford these days. And I thought that in terms of Ron's, Ron's narrative kind of takes it, takes it for granted that you know who he is and that not being the case, I figured, well, we need an annotation to, to fix that up. Well, also very few people then or now know the story of Ivor Anderson, always known as Tiny because he was so big. Um, he was a young Danish immigrant. He worked in the BC lumber camps. He rode the freights with Liversidge in the dirty 30s. He traveled with him to Spain. He survived the sinking of their ship by Franco's submarine. And then he fought in Spain in countless battles. Was, was ac actually, he actually had a commendation for bravery. Now, the, the international brigades weren't your normal sort of military outfit that would sort of routinely issue commendations and, and salute and you know, that kind of thing. It was a little bit different kind of organization, but he was so good that they actually gave him a formal commendation. Uh, and he fought in the battles right to the very end of the Mac Paps in Spain when in the very last days of the fighting, he is killed in a, a, a heroic and a, and a very tragic way that you can read about in, in the book. Um, again, that's, that's history that uh, all the Mac Paps knew that story. When they came back, everybody knew the story of Tiny Anderson and, and his death in the Sierra Pandals. But uh, nobody now knows. Uh, Livers, uh, Anderson actually, as, as a Danish immigrant, wrote uh, a number of, of really, really interesting letters in Danish home to his parents when he was in Canada, giving a very, very uh, detailed description of what it was like to be uh, 
uh, a, a Danish immigrant, half working in the in the woods industry and half being unemployed and trying to make your way through this strange society. Uh, and those letters were collected and, and edited and uh, published in, in one of the uh, the ethnic journals. And again, it's uh, it's just part of someone who in Liversedge's book, he knows who he's talking about. The people who were with him knew who he was talking about, but the story isn't, isn't well known. And it's the kind of, of uh, annotation that I thought should be, should be written up for, for many of the people and, and many of the events. Now, for sure, it's Ron's actual memoir that's the best part of the book, but uh, I think you will find some good detail if you uh, go and actually read the annotations. And I must say, I had a lot of, of, of good times doing that research and writing. Now the third problem was taking up for where, from where Irene Howard had left off 40 years earlier. But the passage of 40 years actually made things infinitely easier for me. Um, I think that Canadians had become in some ways more knowledgeable about the fact that there actually were Canadians in the Spanish Civil War, and more interested in that. The Cold War, I mean, I cross my fingers and say the Cold War is over, but you know, you never know, but it certainly was not the kind of issue that was going to prevent some publishers anyways from uh, publishing Ron's memoir, no matter how explicitly partisan it was. So I started by sending the manuscript package with the memoir and the annotations and some photos and a bibliography and so on. I only sent it to four publishers. And of the four publishers, two of them immediately said they wanted to publish it. One was in BC and one in Ontario. Um, so I talked to uh, this guy, Rolf Maurer. He is sort of the human whirlwind head of New Star Books in Vancouver. And uh, it was like taking candy from a baby. He just said, yeah, let me add it. He really wanted to publish it, and we very quickly came to an agreement to publish Mac Pap. Now, I hope you know about New Star Books. Um, it is a small, but it's an incredibly active publisher of some quality books that speak about the social history and politics and art of British Columbia in particular. And I hope you check out its publication list. It's always a treasure trove of authors that are exciting when their books appear, but like Mac Pap, have an amazing ability to stay relevant and readable through the years. So I was really, really happy that New Star, with such little effort on my part, uh, was, going to, was going to publish it. And so we were ready to go with just the final problem. Well, the fourth problem was answering the question that I actually dreaded trying to answer, which was, well, it's all very well for you to go charging off and publishing this, but actually somebody owns this. Uh, there's copyright laws and so on. Who, who actually had the legal right to publish this manuscript that by accident happened to be in my filing cabinet? Well, that involved some detective work, and I had actually a good time playing detective, tracking down Ron Liversidge's very, very few remaining descendants. And I did find some, and there was interesting stories there for sure. But it turned out that uh, in the end that they actually weren't the people who owned the manuscript and who uh, had the rights to publish it, and, and uh, I had to go off in other directions. And what I eventually discovered was that before Liversidge died, he had actually officially copyrighted the book in the registry in, in Ottawa. And that after he died, uh, his widow, Mildred, had again made a formal assignment of the rights to the book to the organization of MACPAP veterans that had existed at the time back in 1975. Uh, the MACPAPs uh, maintained until they were all gone, uh, some kind of organization that kept them together and kept them 
sharing their stories and, and taking on projects of, of many kinds uh, that had a relationship to Spain. Initially, after the war, they, uh, they were very active in raising money to support uh, sp Spanish refugees, people who had fled the, uh, the country after Franco came to power. Um, they actually did a lot of mutual aid work amongst themselves. I mean, the Spanish Civil War was, wasn't different than any other war. There were shell-shocked people, there were people that came back with no legs, and people that came back uh, you know, really needing assistance. And so the MACPAPs had, a, uh, had an organization that, that functioned to support those people. It carried on, but time took its toll and, and uh, the Mac Paps started to, started to disappear. One by one, they, 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 they passed on. And the organization opened itself up to essentially family and friends. And so the, the organization uh, became the friends of friends and veterans of the, of the uh, Mackenzie Papineau Battalion. And then they started to realize that, well, wait a minute, actually there were Canadians who were in the Mackenzie Papineau Battalion. There were also Canadians who served in the other inter international brigades. Uh, um, many Canadians served in the Americans, inter uh, Americans Battalion, the, the Abraham Lincoln, excuse me, yes, the Abraham Lincoln Battalion. I have to get that right. There's a, there's a controversy about that. Um, and so they, they renamed the organization having to do more or less with the, with the international brigades. Uh, anyways, it went through a number of, a number of, uh, of sort of legal changes of form and I had to kind of track those all through. And eventually you come to the end of the line and it is now an organization that still exists in, in Ontario and it's called the Mackenzie Papineau Memorial Fund. And its most recent project was raising the uh, money to establish a very wonderful monument uh, on, ca on uh, Parliament Hill in Ottawa that has, in fact, it's inscribed um, pretty much every name of every Canadian who went to Spain. Now, at that time, um, just to show you the end of the transition of those organizations, when I was able to contact them in 2012, the, amongst their membership was still a fellow named Jules Paivio. Uh, and I'll tell you a bit about him in a minute. But the organization was extremely cooperative. They were glad to grant formal permission to publish the memoir. And as, as Ron would have wanted, uh, the arrangement, just so you know, is that all of the royalties from the publication uh, go to the MACPAP fund. Now this is Jules Paivio. He was the last living MACPAP veteran, and he was a lucky guy to be that. In 1938, he was a 19-year-old Finnish Canadian kid who had volunteered to be in Spain, and he had the misfortune to be captured by Franco's troops. And what they did with him was they took him and others to the wall of an olive grove where they were going to be shot. Now, if you have read any um, history from any point of view about the Spanish Civil War, you'll know that's what the fascist forces did. They just shot prisoners indiscriminately. So that was the standard procedure for them and, and Jules is actually literally up against the wall and he knows it. But then, kind of deus ex machina, at the very last moment, the fascist brass from higher up drove up in a Mercedes Benz and they ordered that instead of shooting him, he would be used as a prisoner exchange hostage instead. Well, whew. so Jules Paivio lived to tell the tale, and lucky for him he did. And he did tell that tale, and he campaigned for recognition of his fellow Spanish vets all of his life. <laughs> 
His life came to an end in September 2013, and the last of the Mac Paps was gone. But it was in that very month, with his help, and with the help of so many others, that Ron Liversidge's memoir of Spain was at last published. Just a coincidence, but a kind of a carrying on of the torch in a way. Now, Jules, nor Ron Liversidge, nor any of the 500 Canadians who died fighting fascism in Spain, nor any of the thousand more who survived ever received the slightest official recognition or thanks for their sacrifices. Much too late and much too little, there have been some fine monuments erected in some of Canada's capitals. This is the one in Ottawa, or this is part of the one that's on Parliament Hill in Ottawa. This is the one that gives, that is in uh, the Parliament buildings at, in Victoria, British Columbia. It was uh, erected about 10 years ago by a, a wonderful fundraising effort that happened here. Well, those monuments give passers-by a glimpse into the window of the story. But I think we can and we should pay honor to those fighters at the very least by ensuring that the full meaning of their story is not lost to the memory of this country. And that means knowing the story. Well, we have a lot to discover, all of us. We have all of us a lot to learn. And I have to tell you that I think that Ron Liversidge's memoir of the Mac Paps is a great place to start. So, thank you. So I'd, I'd be happy to take any questions. Yes? What parallels do you see with um, the Spanish Civil War, Canadian Bowman, the Spanish Civil War, and maybe Ujava today? Mm. You know, you know, I, I've been bracing myself for that question for about a month. Um, I just keep trying to think what, what Ron Liversidge would have said to that and separate that from what I would say about that. Um, I mean, in some ways, there, there, there's a very you know, clear surface parallel that you can make between Canadians who, uh, you know, again, with the opposition of the federal government, are going to the Middle East to fight. I mean, that, that part, that's, it's, that's, that's an easy uh, parallel to make. Um, who they're fighting for is where it gets a little more difficult. Um, I, I am, a, a, I think, overly fond of the Spanish Civil War because, I, in a way, it, it was, it, although there was a huge differentiation on the Republican side as well as this fascist side, but in the, there, basically, the good guys were on the right side, and you and you could you could sort of say yes, they were, in varying ways, united in doing the right thing for the right reason. They were gonna, they were gonna save their country from, from fascism. Um, I personally, no, number one, confess to not being particularly knowledgeable about, about the Middle East, but with that caveat, say, I, I'm afraid I don't, I don't see the Spanish Republican government anywhere in the Middle East that, that the, the forces that are fighting in the Middle East uh, all to me seem to have elements that are reprehensible and elements that you would support. And so we have Canadians who have gone to fight uh, for ISIL. And we've gone, we have Canadians to fight against ISIL. And I, I, if you ask me, and I think if you ask Ron Liversidge, neither of them would, would have the kind of, of, of sort of wholehearted endorsement that you could give to someone who was fighting a, an enemy that was just as um, unquestionably and 
and um, unadulteratedly evil as, as fascism. Now, that's not to say that there aren't people, there aren't organizations in the Middle East who, who, uh, who you can again make a comparison to as, as being fascist. But the, the motivations, the, the power politics, the oil politics, the, the um, spheres of influence of the West, the, the, uh, the British and the Americans, and the, uh, the, uh, the divisions between those who, who are um, resisting the Americans on the basis of what one might say was a kind of anti-imperialism and those who are resisting on the Americans because they, or, the, or, the, or the West generally, or democracy generally, because of the desire to, to impose uh, the kind of religious belief and practice that, that most of us would find abhorrent. How you unsort that, I'm sorry, I, I, I really wish I, if I knew more about the Middle East, maybe I could sort it out. But the, the parallel is there on the surface, but I think that, that what is missing from that experience now is that the, 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 the cause, if you will, was so, so, uh, so clear and, I guess, unadulterated, if you will. So I, I think there are surface parallels, but, but you know, if, 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 if Ron Liversidge had been asked to go to the Middle East, I don't think he would have found somebody that he would be prepared to fight for like he was prepared to fight for the Spanish Republic. So I, I, I don't think that answered your question, but it kind of explains why I don't have an answer for your question, I hope. Uh, Al Seeger from SAP. I too have been dragged into that debate incidentally uh, in the last, so oh, maybe 18 months. Uh, the main trigger was some relatives of mine are kind of uh, right-wing Spanish Canadian types who don't have much sympathy with the Spanish Civil War, uh, the uh, government side, and so there's a kind of mischief, in my view, a political mischief, in drawing that parallel mm -hmm. between the uh, volunteers in Spain and present-day jihadists. There's yeah. many layers to it. But I think the way of uh, getting out of that trap is to understand that this is part of a larger history of Canadians on a global scale. I was talking to um, a Quebec historian who had found, believe it or not, a Quebecois officer who was killed in the British Army during the mutiny of 1857. Uh, in Quebec and elsewhere, there's an increasing interest in the role of Canadian volunteers in the American Civil War, which is maybe the most um, uh, mm -hmm. synergistic because of the idealism that surrounded yep. at least part of that cause. Mm -hmm. And there, there's lots of other stories. And uh, of course, if Jules was around, I, I knew red things in Toronto years ago who knew him. And they could tell you stories about Canadians and Americans and the Russian uh, Revolution and various stages of the Finnish Civil War. So I think there's a, a bigger picture out there. And we should avoid getting trapped into this volunteers in Spain and President Jihad. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and actually, actually, there are Canadians, there are Canadians that are that, that are fighting against the jihadists as well, but but who they're fighting for, I mean, God only knows the you know the motivations and the politics and the economics of that. Thanks, thanks, Al. Yes. It was my understanding that um, there was a manuscript or a portion of a manuscript at the UBC archives. And I'm wondering if that was the Irene Howard version or this version, and whether uh, I know that they weren't able to publish it because of the permissions issue. But uh, did you, did you find that archive as well, and which yeah. version of it sits there at the archives? Uh, well, thank you for asking that question because that sort of is one of the things that eases my guilt somewhat. Uh, at at the UBC archives, they actually had both. Um, it, it, Irene Howard, after she finally gave up trying to get the book published, uh, donated her papers to, to uh, the special collections at UBC, and her version of the manuscript is in, her, in those papers. 
uh, and it's and it was incredibly helpful to to go through that. Uh, I, I, I think that there were some problems with the way she sort of seized it a little bit too enthusiastically, but but by and large, Irene Howard just did a wonderful job, and I, I was happy to go through her version of it at UBC. But the other uh, version of it actually uh, wasn't in anybody's papers. Uh, through a process that I'm not completely familiar with, uh, a, a copy of the very manuscript that I was working with uh, in photocopy form was actually in uh, UBC Special Collections as well, simply as a, as a special book. And they had bound it up and it's on the shelves and has a call number. Um, and so I thought, whew, I mean, at least it wasn't the only copy of the thing in the world that was hiding in my uh, filing cabinets. But, but more than that, um, what I discovered gradually was that over the years, uh, the word got around on the, on the, in the International Brigade's uh, pipeline that Liversedge had written a big memoir, and people would, would write him and ask him for copies of it. And so, actually, you see Liversedge quoted in works in the British Battalion. And yes, indeed, the, the British have a copy of the manuscript. The, you see him quoted in, in works of the uh, Abraham Lincoln Brigade. Uh, and again, the, the uh, manuscript exists in our form in New York. Uh, I finally said, wow, I mean, I don't have to worry about this when I was reading a Soviet book and there's a <laughs> copy of, of Liversidge's uh, manuscript in the Soviet Union or the, the then Soviet Union. So, yeah, the, the short answer to your question is UBC actually had both all the time. And uh, so it, uh, people who, who wanted to could and in some cases did go and consult it at UBC. Ken. Uh, hello, I'm Ken Dent, and I'm the son of uh, I, somebody who fought in the Spanish Civil War and was very active thereafter yes. in the uh, veterans movement. So, David, I want to thank you so much. Uh, you shouldn't feel the least bit embarrassed or apologetic <laughs> one second longer. You've done, Ron, uh, great uh, justice, and I must say your collaboration with him posthumously has produced uh, extremely readable, very enjoyable memoir of importance to uh, those people in Canada who treasure uh, uh, freedom, justice, the struggle for freedom and justice in our country and around the world. And uh, if anyone hasn't read it, try and get a copy because it is so readable. Rod, uh, he writes in such a it's a vernacular, it's uh, very racy, it's uh, an extremely enjoyable read, even if you didn't know anything much about the history behind it. Yeah. So thank you, Andy. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you. Well, in terms of getting a copy of the book, which was uh, sort of the subtext of this talk, uh, New Star was supposed to actually have some for sale, and I don't think, I don't think they made it. So, uh, Copies are available at Co-op Books on Commercial, and New Star Books uh, has a website, and it's very easy to uh, order from New Star Books on, online. Yes? Well, I look very much forward to, to reading it, um, but before I do, I'm, I'm wondering if you can uh, throw a little bit of light on a political question. I mean, obviously, in that other memoir of the Spanish Civil War, the one by George Orwell, uh, what really stands out are the, the conflicts between the anarchists and the communists. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's brutal. Obviously, Orwell's writing from a particular point of view. Yes. Um, does um, Livesage go into much detail in, into the, the relationship between these, no. these war and factions within the international buildings? No, he doesn't, actually. Um, and I, I think... Um, I, I, I think that's because what he's doing is writing basically from the memory of what he went through. He arrives in, in Spain actually uh, just uh, about two weeks after the Barcelona uprising happens at, at the beginning of May. He, he, lives, he leaves Vancouver on May Day and he, he, he misses that. 
And in, in his units, his units are pretty homogenous and they're mostly at the front. And um, so they are, uh, by and large, um, English-speaking volunteers and the, the anarchist presence that just isn't, isn't there in terms of what he goes through. So uh, he, makes a very, he makes a very brief reference to uh, the uprising in Barcelona having happened. Um, he doesn't actually editorialize on it very much. He just, he said it was, uh, I think his, his phrase is it was an anarchist pumist rebellion. And I think that's probably not a, you know, challengeable description of what it was. But he, no, he doesn't, he doesn't go into it. And uh, I mean, in some ways, in some ways that, you know, you, you'd like to know what he thought about all that. But on another level, what he's, what he's doing is just telling it sort of as he sees it, as he goes through it. And so there are a number of other areas uh, of, of, of conflict that, again, you, you, won't, you won't find there. Uh, he, the, the, the influence of, of the Soviet personnel, um, he says, well, you know, uh, he, he appreciates the aid they got, uh, he, and he complains about the antiquated weapons that they sent, and, uh, you know, he kind of leaves it at that. It's really pitched at the level of lived experience. Yep, exactly. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't get analytical, he just sort of calls it the way he sees it as what's, what's in front of him. Thanks. Yes? Since this, was, um, since, this, <coughs> since this was such a long undertaking, what, 40 years, um, how is your, like, how is, have you seen the historiography of the Spanish Civil War development? You have a, a living, breathing document, in, um, and how have you personally seen the historiography of the Spanish Civil War development? Well, I have a kind of a categorization of writing about the international brigades in the Spanish Civil War. And, uh, well, I don't know, you show me a categorization, I'll show you oversimplification. But the first wave of writing about the international brigades in the Spanish Civil War uh, are from the vets themselves. They, they, they had gone through this and they, they thought it was important and God knows you know, when, when the whole world finally figures out that fascism has to be stopped a couple of years later, they, they say, hey, wait a minute, you know, we, we were there. And so they write descriptions of their experiences in Spain that, that tend to be not analytical, like we were just talking about, they, they, and, and they tend to gloss over because they're proud of what they did. They have a tendency to gloss over some of some of the, the less Hollywood aspects of things. Um, one of the, th I, I, so I'll, well, I'll tell you what I mean in a minute. That's sort of the first level. Now, in, that, in this categorization, that's what Ron's book is. Ron is in this sort of first wave. It's sort of delayed by 40 years because of me, but, or the Canadian publishing industry, but nevertheless, it, it really is a throwback to that first wave of, of of writing by the vets themselves. Second wave is when some university historians say, hey, wait a minute, there's a lot of good writing here, there's a story here, maybe there's a thesis or a, you know. Um, and, and so there is university writing that in the second wave more or less uh, takes the, vo the volunteers writing and, um, and then adds to it the, the, the record and the, 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 the written sources and the, the, the written accounts of the period and weaves it together. And, but it, it, it again, uh, it tends, tends to be um, from the perspective of the, of, the, of the volunteers themselves, but put in a kind of a more academic and, and accessible form in some cases. Then you get to the third level and the third level is, is when the Soviet Union uh, comes to an end and the international archives are opened up. To some degree, it starts before that because there are other sources, but there is a sort of a third wave of writing about the international volunteers, which, which, is, um, which is muckraking, which is, is uh, 
just absolutely obsessed with uh, issues like the executions because there were executions of international volunteers for cowardice and desertion like there are in most other armies. There were desertions, yes. Um, there, there, there was just an incredible uh, Byzantine set of, of importation of politics from the outside, in, in particular importation of what was going on in the Soviet Union in terms of the, the, the purges that were going on, the show trials that were going on. Um, that wafts its way into, into uh, the Spanish Civil War. There is documentary evidence about precisely what it was that was motivating the Soviet Union in terms of its support or non-support or measured support uh, of, the, of the Republicans at various points in the Spanish Civil War. And, and so there's a, a school of thought that says, gee, these guys were all just dupes, you know, Stalin was just using them and so on. There's a, so there's a sort of a, a third level of, of kind of muckrakey reinvention of the, of the Spanish Civil War in, that, in those terms. Um, I'll probably get in trouble for saying this, but um, if, if you uh, want to read another book on, on, the, Spanish, on the Canadian and the Spanish Civil War, uh, the most recent academic book is, is by uh, Michael Petru. It's called Renegades. And in my categorization, he actually starts off at the first half of the book like that. And that's what he's doing. He's saying, oh, wow, Soviet archives, executions, desertions, blah, blah, blah. By the end of the book, I think, actually, he changes horses in the middle of the book. And by the end of the book, he has gotten into the stories to the degree that he actually ends up in what I would call the fourth category. And the fourth category is where I'm at, and it's this. Um, yeah, there, there were all kinds of, 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 of warts on the face of, of the, the Republicans and the International Brigades and the leadership of the International Brigades and individual soldiers in the International Brigades. There are all kinds of things that you can, you can section out and say, oh, this, that, that wasn't particularly heroic or, or laudable. But that overall, but that overall when, you, when you take a look at who these guys were and why they went and, and exactly how, how selfless and, and, and I, I don't you know, need to use charged language, but I mean they really were heroic. You, would, you knew when you went to Spain that the odds were against you, that, and that, and that the, the basic decision that they made was that they had to go and help try to prevent fascism. Now, if other people had other motives, if other people measured their support, if, if some of them fell by the wayside, well, okay. But when you look past all that, the, the story of the international brigades just is one that, uh, that uh, says, look, there was a historical moment, there was a decision that had to be made, and these guys made the right decision. So I think the volume that you have is kind of a combination of phase one and phase four. Um, but it, uh, you know, there is new writing on the Spanish Civil War every year. It is amazing how many new publications about the Spanish Civil War just continue to come and how each of them adds something to it. Ron's adds something to it as well. And uh, um, I think that, um, I think that we're, we haven't you know, heard the last of the analysis of the, of the Spanish Civil War. I think it's going to continue. We probably have time for about two more questions. Okay. Oh my god. <laughs> Thanks, David. I'm glad that I was one of the people who nudged you into doing this a while ago. Yeah, thank you. So uh, my question is uh, around the, the uh, piece of legislation that you talked about early on in the talk that uh, came with a two-year potential um, imprisonment for having participated. And I'm just curious if of the thousand or so survivors who did come back, if the government had abandoned their efforts to persecute, or was that law still on the books, or, or was anybody uh, pursued with those? Uh, okay, the short, the short answer is no. 
uh, nobody was ever prosecuted under the, under the uh, Foreign Enlistment Act. Um, same story in England, actually. There, there was a Foreign Enlistment Act in England, and all the volunteers from England were threatened with, with uh, punishment under their act. In neither case was anybody ever, ever prosecuted. Um, there, in, in Canada, we know that there was a debate about that and that the RCMP, who had been tracking these people and you know, had, had been trying to stop them from going in the first place and uh, just uh, grilled them all and, and, and interrogated them when they got off the boat when they came back. The RCMP did want to, to, to pursue it. Um, and what stopped it, of course, was the, the political reality that, that how absurd it would be in the spring of 1939, in the summer of 1939, when everybody could see that, no, Can Canada is going to be fighting Hitler and Mussolini any minute now, and are we going to be prosecuting these guys for having done the same thing? I mean, it just, and, and so the politicians reined in the police and the prosecutors who, who actually did want to pursue the charges. But uh, no, in, in the end, it was, uh, it was a bit of a paper tiger. But you know, they, they, it, it was used quite, quite freely in terms, basically, of prevent, uh, you know, preventing some people who might otherwise have gone to Spain. Okay, I think I've exhausted you. So, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you for coming. <laughs>